All right, we're on. Seven o'clock. Seven o'clock, time to rock. Grab your Bibles, grab a chair. Pam's got her nice HO2 going. She's putting in the steps. Got her 10,000 steps today? Not quite, almost. Not I quite. Will. So the, uh, the confetti's not going off yet? Nope. Okay, she's working her way towards 10,000. That's going to be an illustration of mine tonight. Mm. So, I'm glad for the, uh, thankful for the cooler air. It's very nice out there. So, welcome tonight. We're in the Book of Romans. We're going to be in the Book of Romans for some time. And uh, good, good evening, Catherine and John. We'll see who else is on tonight. Good, good to see you guys on. See who else pops on tonight. Hope everybody's doing well. Hopefully you've been reading, uh, folks have been reading through Romans again. I need to read through it again this week. Your sister's on. Can you say hello to her? No, I don't see that. See, mine doesn't tell that say she's hi on. To her. Oh, hi, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. And I have some sisters in Christ on. Yes, he And do. some brothers in Christ. There's mm -hmm. Long Island. Mm -hmm. Catherine and John. Oh, there's Lisa. Yeah. Lisa, Ronnie, and Lindsay. A niece. Brother-in-law. Any others? We'll wait a few minutes. Uh, for those who are in our church, we uh, had in the um, our bulletin Sunday to pray for Larry Moravic uh, that he had cancer. Uh, widespread, and Pam and I went out to see him and his wife uh, Sunday afternoon. And then uh, this morning we got the news that he went home to be with the Lord. So be praying for the Moravic family. Uh, Larry was a believer, so he's absent from the body and present with the Lord. Thankful for that. Pray for his two sons, Brett and Drew, and his wife, Mary Beth. And, uh, but they take comfort in God's promises, like all of us should. And so what a blessing to know when your loved one is a believer that they're fulfilling. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Um, I think of John 17, 24. Jesus prayed that all, all those that were his would see him one day, be with him in glory. So I was telling the family today, Larry's probably saying, wow, wow, wow. Right? I mean, you get to see a glimpse of your Savior, the one you've been reading about, loving, though you had not seen him yet, and now you see him? Imagine what that's like. So, so the family and friends, they're the ones who are at loss, but thankful for God's promises, and Larry is at home. So we're all, we're all headed there, right? All of us realize uh, death will come knocking, as we see in Romans 5. Death has been reigning. Romans 5 speaks about death. It says death has been reigning. How come? Why do we have death? Sin. And particularly, Adam's sin, chapter 5. So in chapter 5, Paul is going to introduce how did sickness and death come into the world? How did we get death? And he says Adam brought it in. Uh, we're going to get into that later in chapter 5, but just to remind ourselves. But in Christ... You can't have a righteous standing with God. You can't be absent from the body and present with the Lord. You can't have confidence, right? Hebrews 10, 19, that you're going to enter in by the blood of Jesus. We saw that last week. We saw that none of us, and I'll probably say this Saturday, his funeral is Saturday at 2 with the visitation at 1. I say this a lot of funerals, and sometimes it shocks people. I'll say, you know, so-and-so wasn't good enough to get into heaven. Imagine hearing that at a funeral of your loved one, and you're like gulping, unless you know the, where I'm headed with it. If I said tonight, Larry wasn't good enough to get into heaven. Do you know why? Because no one is. No one is. It's what we've been seeing. Chapters 1 through 3, Paul's already charged that all are under sin in God's courtroom. There's none righteous, not even one. Our throats are an open grave, right? Uh uh, Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of glorifying God. We've all missed the mark, and we stand in need of forgiveness and a righteousness. So, no, 
Um, he wasn't good enough to get into heaven. Is he in heaven? Absolutely, but why? So tonight we're going to actually talk about it. I thought it was a good lead-in tonight to talk about a death of a friend, death of a loved one. Um, how is it then? I mean, if, if we don't have, if we're not good enough, um, then how in the world? We saw chapter 3. Chapter 3, what did we see? There's a righteousness found where? Apart from law. So he, he says, apart from law, there's a righteousness that's been revealed, 321. What is it? The righteousness of God is through faith in Jesus for all who believe. And this justification is a gift by his grace based on what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. That's what we're, we're going to pick up on some of the themes in chapter 3. We're going to move into chapter 4. Not sure exactly tonight how far we will get. But uh, let's uh, pray together and then we'll, we'll look at the text together. Lord, we give you thanks once again uh, that we can meet online and study your word and contemplate, think about, and apply these truths to our lives and then to others around us. I pray once again as we hear the good news proclaimed that we would be reminded of how we stand before you and that we'd be reminded to share the good news with others because there's only one way uh, to stand before you. And uh, tonight we uh, ask your blessings on what is said and done. May it bring glory to you and good to your people. In Christ's name, amen. All right, so let's just recap a little bit in chapter 3. If you have your Bibles open, hopefully you do. Uh, hi, Judy, and others that may be getting on. So let's recap a little bit. If, uh, if no one can speak a word in God's court to their defense because they're all guilty, and therefore God knows all things, and therefore he doesn't allow any objections, you're guilty. And how in the world can you stand before him righteous? And we see, as last week, it's by faith in Christ. So God, who has given us an atonement for sins, um, it's obtained by faith. Um, a man is justified by faith, verse 28. Um, clearly, verse 28. And we're going to see this all the way through now the rest of the book of Romans. Um, justified by faith apart from works of law. Verse 30, since God, indeed God, will justify the Jews, how? By faith. By faith. And the non-Jews, by faith. So the only way to stand before God is to be declared justified by faith in Jesus Christ. When a person places their faith in Christ, they, in God's courtroom, right we get the verdict now and for the day the final day when we stand before him our verdict still stands justification is an act of god right at the moment of saving faith it's a legal declaration now at some point later we will talk about sanctification but right now for a little while we're going to be talking about this legal legal words that that paul uses to describe what happens to us at saving belief now, chapter 4, follow the argument. What then shall we say about Abraham? How big was Abraham in the Old Testament? Huge. The Jews, even in Jesus' day, remember, wanted to say, well, you know, our father Abraham, our father Abraham. And so Abraham looms large uh, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. So what shall we say that Abraham, our father, according to the flesh, has found? Now this idea of according to the flesh means what he has done in this body. If you were to vindicate yourself, to appeal before God based in your flesh, based in what you have done, what has Abraham found? Okay, Is, was he saved by works? Okay, And as we go through this, let me just say that even though the Old Testament didn't teach it, there were Jews, even in Jesus' day, who had a false view of salvation, just as there are 
people who claim to be Christians today would have can have a false view of salvation that is dangerous right dangerous um, so we're going to get into some of that and we're going to look at some other passages so chapter 4 what then shall we say that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh is found for if Abraham was justified by works if he was declared righteous by works he has something to boast about but not before God so we're going to have we're going to pit works are you justified by works or by faith that's our big discussion tonight is it based on what you've accomplished or is it based on a gift is this gift received by by faith in what Jesus Christ has accomplished or is it accomplished in what you can perform now you might say well Kendall sometimes you talk about good works do we talk about good works did we read a passage last week about good works that Christians ought to be zealous for good works Titus 2 14 Ephesians 2 10 yes but when does that happen after salvation after salvation after justification not before not before so before we have nothing to commend ourselves and even when we're justified the life of a believer because he now knows God in a save saving uh, real way the Holy Spirit comes into their life our heart is made new then what flows from the heart what flows from a life of someone who truly knows God obedience to his ways yeah no, we're not talking about perfection but we're talking about direction we're talking about you're now zealous for good deeds as Paul says in Titus 2 14 and Ephesians 2 10 but there's no now here's the danger what if some group started thinking or started saying you know and I, I've had this happen man if anybody was gonna go straight to heaven it was so and so what does that sound like works works well and you say well why, why do you say that oh boy she was a person of prayer oh she really evangelized oh she was just such a godly woman she was so nice all this if anybody was going to go straight there that to me sounds like you're you're basing it on on works or I don't know I if I talk to somebody and say I don't know I, I just hope I've done enough I hope I've prayed enough what's that sound like works they have a concept of works so sometimes it just needs to be taught sometimes people are just lost religious people can be lost so it is a serious thing how do you plan on standing before God if it is one that is based on what you think you've done it could be that you're in dangerous waters it possibly could be that you're either confused or not converted right um, there were those in Paul's day who had a distorted view and he had to correct it some Jews in Paul's day Paul said man if anybody could be saved by the resume remember we saw this last week in Philippians 2 it would be me so so before God could anybody boast no no for what I love this what does the scripture say isn't that what it all goes back to mm -hmm. if Pam and I are out and Pam you probably had this uh, somebody says something maybe a Christian says something and you're like that doesn't line up with scripture right somebody teaches something now I want to be corrected don't you and I brought this level this is my dad's level he was a carpenter and uh, to find out if a wall is plumb or not if I'm putting up a stud wall right if I want to see something is level I, I grab the standard and I can see if it's a bubble off has anybody ever told you you're just a bubble off right um, so I as I brought this into the house I put it up against one of the walls I want to see if it was plumb if so, that, that bubble is going to be right in between these two lines. When we say certain things about our spiritual beliefs, do you want it to line up with Scripture? So that's, I love, this is why our theme should be always what? Reforming the Scripture. Reforming our minds, everything that we believe according to Scripture. 
not folk religion, not what some book you read, not even what I say, right? Unless it's what? Based in scripture. I love Paul. For what does the scripture say? I'm going to sneeze, by the way. Probably. My, how many have bad allergies right now? I mean, Sunday, uh, my head was just pounding in the back and down the neck. Anybody else having, I think you said grass pollen's high. Mm -hmm. So if I do sneeze, I'll apologize in advance. Um, so let's follow the logic. For what does the scripture say? If I said tonight, what are some things that you've heard people say that just aren't true? And you're like, and you can do that. How many know you can do it in a gracious way? You can say, you know, I don't think scripture says that, right? Bear said you could tell people they have a few screws loose. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you get the kind of same uh, wording there, uh, Bear. Uh, you're a bubble off. Some people may have no clue what you're saying. Um, for what does scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Where is that found? Genesis 15, 6. Pam just simply looking over at her little cross-reference. So most Bibles will, will maybe put it in capital letters if it's quoting. And usually you're, you have a little side note, side column with a cross-reference. So he's quoting when he says, for what does Scripture say? Forget your opinions. Forget their opinions. Forget what, you know, you read here, you listen to this person. Like, I, I want to know where's it at in here, right? What are some of the silly... Sometimes it's just silly things that people say. And you're like, no, oh, Scripture doesn't say that. If I said tonight, what are some things that you've heard people say that you just know aren't, that's not in Scripture? Maybe you don't want to say. Well, that God always wants you healthy, wealthy, prosperous. Yeah. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. You know? Now, always going back, what... Show me that in Scripture. Well, I know it's somewhere in there. I don't think it is. Uh, you show it to me, right? And making sure it's in context. So if you were to go back all the way to Genesis 15, because so Paul's saying, look, well, what does the Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So what does Paul say? Well, what does Scripture say? So let's go back to Genesis 15. Genesis 15. First book of the Bible. You know, your God has, is mentioning. Telling, uh, so the Lord is speaking. Abraham, no, it's not going to be uh, one, one of your relatives who's going to be your heir. Actually, one is going to come from your very own body. He's going to be your heir. Verse 4. So he, he took him outside and he said, look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. Then he, Abraham, believed in the Lord, and it, he reckoned it to him as righteousness. So what is the Lord going to do? He puts Abraham to sleep, right? He splits the animals in two, puts him to sleep. God is going to fulfill his covenant. God is the one who's going to give the land, give the descendants. And in the ceremony, God is taking on the obligation himself. Not to go into all the context because Paul's not going into all the context. He's just mentioning what verse? Verse 6. Verse 6. Abraham said, or uh, Paul says, um, what's the scripture say? The scripture says in Genesis 15, 6, that he believed. God reckoned it, accounted it as righteousness. Well, what do we not have? We don't have righteousness. We don't have a righteous standing with God. Can we work for it? I mean, how many works would you have to do to be able to go right into heaven to stand before God? Is it based on how many times you've gone to church, how much you've given, how much you've prayed, how much have people done for you, how much you've done for them? You know, 
No, because we have all these demerits also. If you're a if you're million dollars in debt and you work and you say, okay, here's $1,000. Great. How much do you have left? A lot. Right? 999,900, right, whatever it is. Right, you just, I mean, okay, you're still in debt. So you, well, great, you've done these good deeds. It, it, you can never stand before God based on that. And so what Paul's going to do, he says, first of all, the scripture says Abraham believed God. Saved by grace through faith. What Paul is saying here, how were the people in the Old Testament saved? By faith. Grace. Yeah, by grace through faith. Now that the Messiah has come, our faith is trusting in what he's accomplished on the cross. That's what chapter 3 is about. Jesus is that place of atoning sacrifice. He turned away the wrath of God, as we're going to see in the book of Romans. It's his righteous law keeping, accredited to our account. Our sins forgiven, his righteousness, we are now reckoned with. Now we stand before God, declared, courtroom language, now an accountant language. Pam's doing the books. She's on QuickBooks, putting in everything in the ledger, draw one side and all this, and you're trying to use a phrase today, you're trying to what? Justify? Uh, reconcile. Reconcile. Right? So you make, a, you, you make a statement that this is now reconciled. And so he's using this interesting language. Watch what he does here. Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor or a gift. But what is due? How many on here have received paychecks? Probably most. Oh, thank you for this gracious gift. Now, you might be thankful that you have a, a boss that's generous and you get to work, but when you get that paycheck, it's based on what you have been doing. Now, Saturday, our grandson had a birthday, and he got some gifts, and it was cool because... One of our daughters gave, Courtney gave Charlie a gift that was wrapped in Cocoa, Cocoa Puffs. Puffs. Box. But he wasn't even excited about that. You know, he grabbed the box. Thank you. He was getting these gifts, gifts of sharks and whatever. Did he work for those gifts? No. He didn't earn them. They were gifts. What did we see last week? This is gifted righteousness. It's a gift, right? That's look. Uh, if you still have your, of course, you have your Bibles open. Take a take a look at um, uh, verse twenty-four, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption. So Judy Kastner wants to know: so is faith by works related to legalism? Absolutely. Yeah, we use that term legalism, right? Um, Somebody could start slipping into legalism in that way. Now, wanting to live a good life, to live a life that glorifies God, that's not legalism, right? So if you're, if you're saying, here are the standards of, of the Christian life. This is how God wants us to live. And somebody says, well, that's legalism. You say, no. We're called to live out our Christian life by obeying God, right? So I get my standing. I was counted righteous in Christ at the moment of saving faith when I was an ungodly sinner. That's my legal standing before God. Now I want to live a life that glorifies God. And, and so to say that we need to, to follow what the Lord says, we're reading, you know, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't gossip, don't slander, you know, love your wife, love, you know, etc. That's not legalism, right? Now, if I said you're only saved if you do all those things, that would be legalism had legalism, if you will, crept into the Jewish religion. Yes, there were people who distorted it, like there are today. There are people, even Christian groups, that really cross the line and get into, I just call it false teaching. Right? False teaching. Right? I'm not going to name any groups right now. That's not my purpose tonight. Um, but it can happen. We need to individually tonight as we're all on here and make sure that's not happening to us. Make sure that we understand what Scripture says and that we fall in line with, with it. So
So good question. So is it does good works have to do with your motive? Like if your motive is gratitude versus your motive is trying to put another what are they? Not trying feather to in your cap. Feather in your cap. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Your motive. Why are you doing that? Are you thinking you're trying to earn favor with God? Somehow you're working your way up there? So it's dangerous. Be motivated by love. That is dangerous, right? Motivated by by just um, gratitude for what God has done and that he's called me to this. I'm already justified. I can't be more justified than I already am because it's it's declared. It's a legal, if you will, a legal word mm -hmm. in God's courtroom, courtroom language. And usually if you really love somebody, you want to please them. Yeah. Yeah, good points. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, Eric said, well said. Yeah, good point. Um, I love how Paul states this. To the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. How big of a stumbling block is that for people? We have to fight it as Christians even, I think. I think so, times. too. It's like this. Before I became a Christian, did I have any works that could any by any means justify me? I was ungodly. Abraham was ungodly. You were ungodly. According to Romans 3, there's none righteous, not even one. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, how is it that you get the standing of being declared righteous? Was it by what you did? No. Or was it by faith? When you trusted in Christ, your sins are forgiven. You're declared righteous based on what he's done for you. So it's not by anything you do now that you're saved. So I love Ephesians 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Mm -hmm. Right? We are his workmanship, verse 10, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So you don't get the cart before the horse. Saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not by works. But then we are, what? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. How many see? I think once you get this, it's It's beautiful. One, it's biblical. Two, what if it, well, think about this. What if it was the other way around? Like I said last week, wouldn't you just quit? It'd be a treadmill going nowhere. Because you would never know. No. Now, like, look. You look, couldn't do it. No, look over at chapter 10. Look over at chapter, Romans 10. So, there were Jews coming to know Christ. We'll get into this in chapter 9. But still, a large number of Jews aren't trusting in Christ. And Paul says, my heart's, look at uh, chapter 10, verse 1. My heart's desire and prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness, seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who what? Believes. Believes. How many times have we said, seen this? Uh, skip up in chapter 9, verse 30. What shall we say? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained it. How? By faith. Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, did not arrive. Why? Because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as it were, works. And then they stumble over Jesus. How many people still stumble over the message of Christianity? They do. I'm not going to trust in a crucified Messiah. No. I'm going to trust that God will put all my good works on one side, all my bad works on the other, and I'm banking that my good are out going to weigh the bad. Most people in our communities believe that. Do you believe that? Do I believe that? No. Do you think most people in yeah. our communities believe that? 
What do you guys think? You think a lot of people in our communities believe that false gospel? I'm, I'm a pretty good person. But then you get the glory instead of God getting the glory. Right. Well, yeah, one. It's focused on you. Number one, it's not where. It's not in the scripture. That's just their own thinking. The best thing to do is say, where do you get that? Well, this is why I believe. Oh, that's no authority. Right? But yeah, then you would be getting the glory. So go back to Romans 4 because he actually gets into that. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of so now he mentions Abraham. He was saved by faith. David also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Where's this found? Psalm 32. Psalm 32. Can you think of an illustration in the Gospels that Jesus shared that kind of paints a picture also? Of what faith without? One, somebody boasting in their righteousness, and two, somebody that didn't have any righteousness but just... Well, the woman at the well yeah. would be... But to a man who said, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Mm. The two men praying. Yeah, that's yeah. Luke eighteen. If you turn, can we turn over there just for a second? I love how Jesus shares this story. Verse nine of Luke eighteen. So Jesus told them this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous. He told this story for those who trusted in themselves and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers and unjust and adulterers or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on all I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven but was beating his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Listen to Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus here. This is awesome. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. Wow. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. I think this is a great picture of what happens when somebody recognizes I'm undone. How in the world can I enter heaven? How can I stand before holy God? I, God, I'm a sinner. Would you save me? I have nothing to commend myself. That's why I said last week, it's almost easier to talk to somebody who, who knows that because now I can give them the good news. I don't have to convict them that they're a sinner. They already know it. And some people, you just got to convince them that it's not that way. You need to see how much you have offended God. And the moment you... Place your saving trust in Jesus. What happens? You're God righteous. justifies the ungodly. Right there. Right there. For me, 1989. Sometimes you may not know exactly when that transaction took place, when you received justification, righteousness. You can just ask yourself today, what am I ultimately trusting in? Right? It's a terrible thing. Yeah, imagine how, what kind of a rude awakening it would be to think that you somehow were good enough and that you're getting into heaven only to have the, heaven's doors shut. Now, there's no self vindicators here, the sign says. No self vindicators. One time I made a sign and I posted it a long time ago when I used to have a blog. I think I'll find it and post it for you. No self-indicators allowed. That's what this is saying, isn't it? Did Abraham some, have something to boast before God? Mm -mm, not before God. Maybe before others. When you and I look at each other, we look at each other and we say, you know, they've done some good. They're, they're a good person. They've helped people out. They're nice. They're kind considerate. That is true on a human level. 
But when it comes to standing before God and giving an account for everything you've said and done in your whole life, push play in God's court. Hmm. Now what? Guilty. Why? Perfect righteousness is required. That, I, don't you think that's where some people have a hard time? That God demands perfect righteousness? Yeah, I think some people have a hard time understanding that it can just be a gift without you doing anything. Yeah. You just fight that like you feel like you got to try to add to it or so do something. So is having a good work ethic, hard work ethic, a good thing? Mm -hmm. It is, right? So, right, our generation was taught good work ethic. What could be the problem? I have a hard time of receiving gifts. I, I, you, I, you've worked for everything that you have. But when it comes to Christianity, it's like, hmm, you can't work for it because it's impossible. And if you think you can, you're in danger zone. You're telling me it has to be a free gift received by, by faith in Christ? It's a gift? Yep. I can't believe that. Okay? I can't change it. Right? Is it humbling to say, I guess in this case I'm a beggar. I hold out my hands and they're empty. I come with empty hands. Nothing to the cross I bring, right? I can't bring anything to the cross. So, I'd like to go on tonight, but hmm, I don't know. Is this blessing on the circumcised, on the Jewish people, or on the uncircumcised, the non-Jews? For we say faith that was credited to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it credited? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? What do you mean by that? Well, the law required, well, the law that Moses wrote later, uh, Abraham, so think about the chronology of Abraham's life. When did he get circumcised? After. After. Watch what Paul says. Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And he received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had while uncircumcised, so that he might be the father of all who what? Believe. Believe without being circumcised that righteousness might be credited credited to them and the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision of the Jewish people but who also follow in the steps of faith our father Abraham which he had while uncircumcised I love this for the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be the heir of the world was not through law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, then faith is made void and the promise is nullified. For the law brings wrath. Why? You're a lawbreaker. Lawbreaker, 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 wrath, wrath, wrath. Meaning you're getting the just recompense for what you've done. That's what the law brings. But where there is no law, there's no violation. For this reason, it is by faith in order that it may be in accordance with grace. So that the promise will be guaranteed. I love this. To what? All the, All the descendants, not only of those who are of the, the law, the Jewish people, who under conviction come to believe in the Messiah, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who's a father of us all. We'll stop there tonight. But think about what Paul's bringing. Remember the overall problem? It, do you start seeing this book starting to fit together? Mm -hmm. Jews, Gentiles, guys, you're all under sin. The only way to stand before God is through faith in Jesus Christ. It's gifted righteousness. So now Abraham is the father of us all. It fits like a glove. If you read read through Romans again between now and next Tuesday, and you start to see the argument that Paul is writing for an occasion. This and great doctrinal stuff. 
for an ultimate occasion to fix that. It's for our lives today too, isn't it? Is it not? Do we need to be reminded of all this? This is, I need my thinking corrected. I need to always remember what scripture says. So, do you get baptized before you're a believer? No, after you're a believer. Not before. Right? How do my good works come into play? Now that you're saved, glorify God in your life. Go through the New Testament. Look out, look, look what Paul writes to the churches. Ephesians 1 and 2, great doctrine. Chapters 3, 4, and 5, and 6, what? How to live. How to live it out. Same way with 1 Peter. So when you get to Ephesians, all this stuff about God's election and predestination and salvation through the blood of Christ and being sealed with the Holy Spirit, that we were dead in trespasses and sins, God made us alive. And then you read chapters 3 and 4, don't like, live like you used to. When you are in darkness, um, don't live that way anymore. That's chapter 4, verse 17 and following. You've put on the new self, which is in the likeness of God. Uh, speak truth to one another. Um, let bitterness and wrath, put away bitterness and wrath and malice and slander. Be kind to one another, verse 32. Tender hearted, forgiving each other. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love just as Christ loved us. And gave himself for us. Do you see all those imperatives? All those commands? Not afraid? To, so if you were to be at our church and you hear, I'm in a section that's speaking about commands, you don't have a problem. Because you understand that what? The indicatives, right? What God has done, our status comes first. Right? Therefore, when you pop in and you hear a sermon on, man, don't be gossiping and slandering and you know, be kind to one another and forgiving one another, you have no problem. Not preaching legalism, not preaching works, right? We already got that settled. Trusting in Christ. I'm a Christian. Now I'm to live this out. Evidently, Paul knows he's talking to a, a community that's not perfect. Why? Now you need to forgive one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. How crazy is it that we just can't, we hold grudges, right? Has God forgiven you? Why can't you forgive others? Walk in love. How come you're not loving? Are you Have you forgotten that Christ gave himself up for us? So anyway, a lot of good stuff. So any thoughts or... Closing thoughts. Is this good news? Yep, we're talking a lot about good news in Romans. Being reminded of what Christ has done for us. We are making application as we go through. This stuff automatically applies. It's gifted righteousness. It's not by something I've worked for. You have gifts. and You, have, you can basically tonight put two columns up here. Works. That's based on what you've, you've done, right? All of that. Versus receive it by faith. Credited as righteousness. I, I haven't done anything to earn this. As a matter of fact, I bring demerit to the table. So. Everybody must be following because they seem good. Yeah? We're all on the same page? Sounds like it. So you get a knock at your door? Uh, you need to join our religion. Um, you got to be married in a temple. You need to follow our words of wisdom because we have a living prophet. And if you don't wear these special garments and get married in our temple, you can't see God. What say you? False gospel. Oh, you need the merits of other people, the merits of the saints, other people's merits, uh, right? You need this, all these other things. Uh, 
It doesn't, I don't see that in here. So we have to be careful to, to uh, what? Protect the gospel that we see in the New Testament. Um, so. Okay. Judy Hausner, does faith and righteousness as a gift, is it consistent with the thief on the cross who Jesus saved at the last moment of life? Yeah, thanks, Judy. I think that's a great picture of God's grace, isn't it? Isn't it? I mean, that's a great picture. And if you find, I, I, I've taught this at different times, and I'll see people, and I, I'll say something like this. You're thinking it's not fair, are you? And I, I've actually had, yeah, it doesn't seem right. Like, I live my Christian life, and, you know, somebody gets saved at the last moment, and they get to go in. And what what am I sensing there? So it's a good point, Judy. I think it is a great picture of God's grace, where we ought to be happy for God's grace being shown, right? Yeah, because I'm really happy. I got saved at a young age. Yeah, the same thing. Yeah, you got saved I... at a young age. But how terrible would it be if you're grudging the John Doe over here? I literally pushed a guy in a wheelchair at the park. He was he was in uh, he was at a care center in town, and I pushed him in the park, and I, I said, David, do you know anything about God? You know, where are you going to go when this life is over? And he said, Kendall, I'm going to hell. I said, why do you say that, David? He said, because I, I don't know anything about God. And I said, do I have permission to talk to you about God? And to make a long story short, he became a Christian. He became a Christian. And it's just one of those clear examples. And why wouldn't we be happy for that? We always should be. You know, it's kind of like the guy that goes out to a park and says, hey, will you work today? And, you know, at this time, and... Anyway, I won't go in. But yes, Judy, that's a, I think it's a great picture of God's grace. Any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, pray for Bear as he uh, interacts with uh, some uh, Mormons who are trusting in themselves that they are righteous. They, they love that statement. Um, we are saved by grace after all that we do. What? What? Uh, you know, to say that I have to go to this temple, that I have to wear these garments, that I have to do all of this, that would be works. So, all right. Hope everybody has a good week. Keep thinking on these things. Let me challenge you. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the challenge between now and next week. Read through Romans again. So pray. let's pray. Lord, we give you thanks uh, once again that we get to fellowship tonight uh, around your word uh, together. We pray that these truths would create so much joy in our hearts and our lives as we uh, think about what what extent you've gone to and how gracious you really are we do stand amazed and uh, we pray that we would live lives of gratitude and uh, be able to share this good news with others to help people understand um, may you use us may the holy spirit use our words even this week uh, we pray for all that are online tonight that will uh, be talking to others about these truths we, uh, once again, thank you for this time in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. God bless. We'll see you next week.